Okay, welcome to the Sumer Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm joined by Tage Seth, the data scientist extraordinaire. I'm excited for this show, Tage. We get to read, we get to read questions from listeners, questions from tweeters, people who want to know what we know. Uh, I'm excited for this one. It's been a long week, as you know. We're preparing for the draft. We're preparing for the draft show that we're going to have on Thursday night. Uh, and I, I'm just in your hometown of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Tash, how you doing? I'm doing well. I was, I was thinking about this as that music was playing. Like, at what point does it switch from a mailbag episode to like people calling it the inbox episode? Because no one really sends mail anymore. It's all it's all just emails now. Right. Exactly. Like, did back in the day when because I was you know a sports talk radio show fan when I was younger, but. But even then, you had emails. Like the first ever time I got on Sports Talk Radio, I it was an email and it was a joke. Uh, in fact, it was uh, yeah. I I had I made the the talk show host who's a Detroit Lions fan, even Dan Cole, the common man uh, in Minneapolis. He he fell over laughing at, at my joke. But it was an email. I wonder though, when did it go from being an email from from like being actual mail, like where people like are mailing in letters. And, you know, right now we're like thirsting, of course, like back in the day, you know, like in the nineties, like you'd have to wait until like Wednesday morning to get the stat sheet from the NFL, mm -hmm. uh, to like know all these things. Uh, Sean Donahoe knows, uh, the common man is a K fan legend. Of course he is my, one of my favorite radio shows when I was a kid. And, um, and, and now of course you, you get it, you know, live stats, you get live everything. And so we have to be, of course, uh, incredibly, uh, up to the minute with everything, um, so yeah, it's going to be probably what a, a, a mailbox episode. Now it's an inbox episode. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with this. I'm going to go with the first, the first one that people are asking, uh, Jake Grossman, uh, who, who we both met personally, good guy, Michigan alum or Michigan mm -hmm. student. Uh, Lost it in, we'll, yeah. Yeah. would love to hear you guys as you guys discuss the marginal utility and or diminishing return concept in a bit more depth in terms of the relationship between trading up or down and the number of picks a team already has. This is a good question because I think um, when we look at, basically when we look at kind of this idea of like having the difference between having five draft picks and the different and 12 draft picks and how many players actually get to make your team versus how many players, uh, you know, end up being cut and go in the practice squad. I, I got to say, like, I think it's a little bit, overrated the the concept of you can have too many draft picks just because I think veterans are well for one I think even if veterans have dead money you can push debt you know dead money is not as onerous as people like to believe and anytime you have young rookie contract players on your team and they've made the team right they are already because of the survivorship bias they're going to be a surplus for your team because of how cheat they are on the current rookie wage scale yeah I, I mean i think that's a great point like i think when you look at kind of gaining picks throughout the draft it isn't a one-to-one -one relationship where each pick is going to mean the same thing when you go from for example five to six picks to like 11 to 12 picks like i think there is a little bit of a, a diminishing return there like jake mentioned where you like you said like it, it is a it is a capped uh, roster that you have where you know you can only have the 53 guys on your roster you have to kind of consider how many veterans you have how many players you want to have on your roster for the next two or three years or the length of the rookie contracts that you're drafting and from it it's, it's, you know varies a lot from a, a team to team basis where if you do have that team that needs a, a reset a young influx of talent like I look at the Rams as a team that was like that these past two years where they have this young influx of talent come in as their veterans started to age out and like that kind of matched up with their timeline um you know the Packers I think are another team where the Devontae Adams trade the Aaron Rodgers trade and then they all have their young guys kind of come in but like it doesn't work for everyone like you mentioned in the article like the Chiefs aren't a team that that really need to sustain that young influx of talent over and over just because like their, their floor is always going to be really high because of what Mahomes and Reed offer for them. Yeah. And the article you're referring to is the one about draft picks and kind of this idea that different tranches of the draft offer different types of players. Right. So one of the things I was thinking about in our boss, Thomas Dimitrov in the other room, you know, when we, we we've always talked about Julio Jones trade and this idea that there's, there's, 
selection bias in these draft curves because the the top 10 picks are predominantly chosen by teams that aren't very good. And mm -hmm. so look at like the Ben Baldwin chart, those picks that those charts are going to be flatter because those teams are not going to get as much out of those picks as say an Atlanta Falcons 2011 team. That's going to get a lot out of Julio Jones because they are, if I calculate it correctly, about four percentage points more likely to win the Super Bowl than the average team that has the sixth pick versus the Cleveland Browns, who are not going to do anything with that, are, isn't going to do anything with that pick on average because of you know that that Browns team. You know, no offense, but in that in that like six or seven year stretch, had five or six coaches, and so it was just never going to happen for them. And so that pick had more utility to Thomas Dimitrov than it did to. Uh, the GM of the time for the Cleveland Browns, whoever it was, they had like four during that stretch. Now, the that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that the picks that you're surrendering later in that, you know, the picks that Thomas surrendered weren't also worth more, right? Because, you know, second round picks are going to perform better that, on a good team than second yeah. round picks on a bad team. It's just that what does your team prefer? We know that most of the blue chip talent, and this is the, the research by Michael Lopez, the director of data and analytics for the NFL, or this that was his title the last time I checked. He 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 did in, in his blog post show that you know blue chip talent, generally speaking, comes in the first 15 picks, 10, depending on the position, 15 picks, 10 picks, 25 picks. And so in in theory, if you're looking at this from an additive perspective, yeah, you're giving up more in the back half of the draft as well. But from a likelihood of gaining a blue chip player, it is more it is more valuable to be a good team. And trading up is more is more passable in my mind when you're a better team. And so, if you're a team like the 2022 Chiefs, where you're giving up Tyreek Hill, your defense had been atrophying for a while. And you needed to go up and that draft in your mind was only 20 players deep, 25 players deep, and you're picking at 28 and 29. You have to go and get a Trent McDuffie and get a blue chip player on your team, get an actual pillar player. You're more likely to than a, than a team that's not as well endowed as you are. Right. No, that's a great point. And like, I think it's, it's the role that they come into. Like you think about Julio Jones and like the other pass catchers that the Falcons had when Julio Jones joined that team where it didn't fully have to revolve around him from day one. If he joined the Browns, like you talked about, like that would have been a lot more pressure on Julio Jones. You know, the development might not have been there. And something else that I was talking to our friend Sam Schwartzen about yesterday is it's also the positional coaches that you have. Like I think there's certain positional coaches around the league that do a really good job of developing talent above expectation. You think about the 49ers with defensive linemen, the Steelers with wide receivers, the Eagles with uh, offensive linemen. And I think like that all influences the, these draft curves as well. If you want to get more granular when, when looking all the, at all that stuff, but, um, but yeah, so if you so want to replicate that work, by the way, you can create a draft curve for every team. If you plug yeah. in the preseason win total or preseason Vegas odds, and you can even use win total as well for all those teams and you can actually determine like when the peaks and valleys are for for a for a team drafting where they're drafting in the first round it's actually a, a pretty cool exercise and i think most teams if they're not already doing that should be doing that yeah no exactly i think i think that's a that's a great point i'm sure like you know a team like the eagles would have something built in they were like if we take an offensive lineman in the third round uh which we know howie roseman spent a, a very high percentage of his draft capital on offensive defense linemen. I'm sure he trusts the coaches that they have there to, to develop that. So let's go on to uh, Tristan Darty's question here where he goes, what is the value of having an elite tight end? And how is that value compared to other premium positions such as wide receiver, cornerback, edge, left tackle, et cetera? With Bowers in the draft, would love to hear your guys' thoughts. Okay, firstly, I want to give a shout out to uh, now I haven't gotten to hang out with him for a few years, probably you know because of how busy he is. He's like, uh, I don't know if he wants people. To he has a real job on the side, and he's like quite like it's like a real person job. But like Jason Fitzgerald, like yeah. does the cap stuff on the side, and he's phenomenal at it. He just posted on Sunday a three hour and forty five minute podcast, and you know obviously when you and Sean have a podcast, I listen. When when you and Arjun had your show before. Uh, I listened, uh, when Jason does a podcast, I never, I never miss one. And, 
Um, but I, I do want to show, I, I do want to show from their website uh, over the cap here, if I can share my screen for a second here, let's look at the tight end contracts. Um, and here we have, you know, and, and firstly, I want to kind of give a little bit of an idea here on, uh, the position as a whole, because it's very interesting, right? Waller is not with the team that drafted him. Hawkinson's not with the team that drafted him. Uh, Angram's not with the team that drafted him. And Dalton Schultz and Noah Fant and T and Taysom Hill are not, and Taysom Hill wasn't even drafted are not what the teams drafted him, and so when you look at that, like tight end is a weird position in that you're oftentimes drafting somebody, and you as a Lions fan know this better than anybody. You're <laughs> oftentimes drafting somebody else's star tight end, so that it developmentally that's an issue, but then from a value standpoint, right? If you take a tight end. Uh, with like a top five pick, let's say, and their APY is nine million, eight, eight million, nine million. If that tight end on day one is the best tight end in the NFL, that is evidently worth 17 million APY. So yeah. when you look at that from a surplus value perspective, that's eight million dollars of surplus value, which is good that you can do a you can get a safety, you can get a running back, you can get uh, two backup players for that amount of money. It's it's not bad, but let's take a gander actually at a different position here. Um, and I want to make sure that we we do this right. We get wide receiver. So Tyree Kill and like you know my my colleague over to the to the right here, Chase Falvey, will probably poo poo this. But let's actually go down to Devonte Adams. It's probably more representative at twenty eight million a year. Now, if you take a wide receiver at fifth overall, it's still eight or nine million APY. It does not matter. That is the difference now that we have a new 2011 CBA where everybody is slotted in no matter what at the same salary. But if that guy like Jamar Chase comes in and plays at like basically top end of the league level, he's worth 28 million on the open market. Okay. So now you're talking about a $20 million surplus, $19 mm -hmm. million surplus, depending on eight or 9 million, whatever. So you're talking about more than two times as much surplus value just comparing wide receiver to tight end, which makes it a very and 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 again, taking even out of the the fact of the matter that the probability that a tight end comes in, he's the best player at the position right away, is way less than the likelihood that a wide receiver comes in and he's the best player at the position right away. They take take that out of the let's even for argument's sake assume that those likelihoods are the same. You're still getting way less surplus value out of the tight end than you are of the wide receiver. So that that's what makes the Brock Bowers discussion incredibly hard. It's A, you have to nail the eval. And even if you nail the eval, Tej, it's still not worth as much as a wide receiver, right? And so you're still, it's just like, it's just math. Like, and and that that's what makes it really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with all of that. I think when you combine what the APYs are for tight ends compared to some of the other positions that Tristan mentioned, wide receiver, um, you know, offensive tackles. Like, I think there's there's a gap there. You could make an argument that the elite tight ends are, are underpaid. That's definitely in, in line with my thinking, where I think the top five tight ends in the league that provide, um, you know, mid wide receiver one levels of receiving and, and also fill in on the blocking are probably getting underpaid. But the delta between like the sixth best tight end in the league and the 15th, is much smaller than I think the sixth best left tackle and the 15th best left tackle, for example. Like I think, I think tight end is a position where unless you have an elite one, there's not much of a, a difference. Um, you know, once you go into that next tier, so then it comes down to, do you want to play that, that gamble of looking at the success rate of first round tight ends and seeing how often uh, these, these first round tight ends didn't pan out for the, the team that drafted them, like you mentioned. And then you look at this, the recent success rate of first round wide receivers and even the receivers that have been taken outside of the top 10 um, have, have done really well instantly. Like you think about the Chris Olaves, the Garrett Wilsons, you know, obviously the, the biggest example is Justin Jefferson. Like so many of these receivers have stepped in after being drafted in the first round, even outside of that, that top tier of players and have, have done well as rookies and, and continue to do well after that. Well, and, and you bring up such a good point. And there's a really good question from Oliver underscore econ on Twitter, who had a couple of good questions. That, are truly elite tight ends like Kelsey not worth more because after their rookie contract, you do not have to pay elite wide receiver money? Yes, 
there's an element to that. But we're talking vis-a-vis the draft because the fact of the matter is, like, who is the last first round tight? Who's the only first round tight end over the last six years that's earned a an actual second contract with the team that drafted him? It's David, David Njoku, Njoku. who yeah. is who is not very good as like I wrote the article for PFF, like explaining why David Njoku got the contract. It's like this is a projection, and we're going to talk about the Josh Allen contract. But I do want to talk about why that is actually a miss by the Jags, and not for the reasons people think, but. That's the whole point. Like, we're not saying don't take tight ends in round three or round four. We're ta- we're saying the Samuel Porter draft pick was a very good one. Yeah. We're saying don't take a tight end when the opportunity cost is a tackle or a, a corner or an edge because edges in round two, that's that curve is steeper, right? And that and and mm-hmm. the and tackle is steeper and wide receivers less steep. And this is this is my point about wide out. And I'm gonna make the point. With respect to Kelsey, Kelsey as a rookie sat almost the whole year as a second year player with an injury. As a second year player, Kelsey was a was the second tight end on the Chiefs behind Anthony Fasano. Anthony Fasano did all the blocking for the Chiefs and Kelsey played that kind of like hybrid role. And this is this gets to your point about wide receivers and why the curve is flatter. And why it's and why your expectations for Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunes should be a little tepid for wide receivers that are picked high. That guy has to line up and be the everything everywhere all at once wide receiver for Mm -hmm. your football team. He's got to play inside. He's got to play outside. He's got to beat. He's got to beat press man. He's got to be able to motion. He's got to do everything. A player that you pick at the position at 40 or 30 or whatever, McCole Hardman played up to his draft position and Chiefs fans don't like to hear that, but he played a role on a successful offense because wide receivers at that at that draft position only have to play a certain part on an offense. The, 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 it, but in, in our modern NFL, our modern NFL is 11 personnel. There's one tight end. And so that tight end's got to be every, he's got to block. He's got to catch. You don't play as many 12 personnel sets anymore. And so if you draft a tight end in the, in the first round, he's got to be like Sam Laporta, who's a boss at blocking and catching. And that's just a hard gamble. It, just like it's a hard gamble for Marvin Harrison Jr. to come in and be a great wide receiver. It's not as hard of a gamble as it is to be a great tight end, though. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I watched the Lions go, you know, first round Brandon Pettigrew, first round Eric Ebron, first round TJ Hawkinson. Uh, you know, none really did much for the team after the, the third, fourth year uh, that they were drafted by the Lions. Lions take a, an athletic tight end on day two, and instantly he's he's at least like a top 10, maybe top five tight end already in the league like that that's kind of like the the bets that you want to make the Packers did something similar right like Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft very very athletic tight ends both taken on day two and they both look like they're going to be staples of the Packers offense going forward Uh, yeah even even it took Vernon Davis one of the great tight ends you know top five top 10 pick top I think he was pick sixth it took him three years Mike Singletary was like kicking him off the field and yeah. and it took him year four before he's any good it's just a hard position to play you have to learn you have to be an offensive lineman and a receiver at the same time it's just it's a tough position and then beyond that it's just the suppressed marketplace where if you fail at the position so here's the, here's the other part and this is why we talk about the market it's not because we're trying to dehumanize the players it's more when you fail and and this is human capital so when you fail at acquiring these players you you can the question is can can you go out and access the those players in free agency at wide receiver if you fail you have to go out and pay 20 million for Christian Kirk if you fail at tight end you can go and spend i mean let's look at let's look at the market again if you fail at tight end and you know people might not like this name but like you can go out and get Evan Ingram you know that's a pretty good tight end for 13.7 million you know yeah. so it's it, and so Evan Ingram's a much better tight end than Christian Kirk is a wide receiver for 7 million dollars less you know and so it's just the 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 cost of failure is less too and th- and that's that's the whole point it's and you know it's about the bets you make so let's move on to the to the next one this has been fun so far uh very much um CD please TD uh, why do you think a lot of teams seem willing to wait to extend on superstar talent till year four? This is great. I'm going to, I'm going to throw another question in there as well. 
despite heavy incentive to do so after year three. Thinking about the guys who are first rounders, whose fifth year options are picked up in this case. There's another question, uh, and this is from David Sparks, who's asked a couple ones. David, 910112. Uh, we're going to have a sitcom about this in the future. What do you make of the Josh Allen contract? And he's talking about the defensive end for the Jaguars. So, yeah, I think both of these are, are really good questions. I think, again, like when you look at a team like the Eagles, who are, are very proactive about getting extensions done, like you, you want to do that after year three when, when you have the, the uh, example to do so, because I think a lot of these teams recently have made bets on either like players um, you know, maybe having a, a year where they don't have to get a top of the market extension, but just because of the way the cap grows and the way that contract inflation happens in general across every position, especially in free agency, when you wait until after year four to, to pay a player, you have to play the whole franchise tag game where, you know, everyone's wondering if the player is actually going to stay on the team, if they're going to get tagged in trade or if they're going to get tagged and extended. And I think that's a lot to put on on on, on a, like an entire ecosystem, but like not even on the granular like contract level, you're going to end up paying top of the market anyways. So when you can get ahead of these extensions and you can do more with the guaranteed money in regards to to rolling it over, prorating it, using void years to your advantage, I think all of that stuff is is more beneficial and and gives teams more incentive to get these contract extensions early, just because of the flexibility it gives you. I think you. Nailed it. I, I think the only thing I can add is the Josh Allen contract for the Jags is an admission of a misevaluation of the player mm -hmm. because Josh Allen was ascending. I mean, he was not very good as first year, a little bit better second year, but he was getting better. And that we've seen that like edge is a solid position. You, you've done a ton of work on it. I've done if you're big, fast, and strong, and you are productive, there's not much more to it. And and Josh Allen is big, fast, and strong, and he was increasing his productivity. He was productive in college at Kentucky, and he was increasing his production in the NFL. And so after year three, you could you could have made him an offer that would have been not a, not a top-of-market deal. After year four, you could have made him an offer that would not have been top-of-market deal. And his year four numbers were more than good enough to buy into, in my opinion. Yeah. And so now, and, and this is the other part, and it actually came up with the Derek Brown deal as well. Because Derek Brown was signed in for four years, which isn't so bad. The other part is when you draft players, especially players of premium positions, and I think Kansas City has done a really good job at non-premium positions. They know a priori. You're a four-year player and you're out unless you come back and take a really low end deal. But if you draft players at premium positions, you are you are committing to them long term. And so my issue is if you I I just don't understand the haggling over this this these this money when the cap goes up and there are externalities that make it harder on you everywhere else. The, the Panthers have very clearly paid a tax for the Brian Burns situation. They have very clearly, and, and it's not it's not Dan Morgan and Brant Tillis and, and Dave Canales' sins. It's the sins of the past. But they have very clearly paid a tax for how they handled the Burns situation in the past. And if you do not, if you're if you are not careful about how you handle your own draft picks at premium positions, you don't think it's going to be harder to sign free agents. And so you haggle over a million, three million, four million here and there on your pillar players. You're going to have to pay up on free agents and players like that later on. So that's where I, I struggle with the Josh Allen thing. They ended up having to pay a ton anyway when paying up a little bit to a year ago would have would have probably not soured anything on Josh Allen's end and would have made probably the positive externalities of paying him more profound than paying him when he's on the franchise tag after everybody's got a little bit of a sour taste in their mouth. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like I think Sean brings up a really good point here in the chat where he goes, the difference in the Montez Sweat and Josh Allen contracts, given their relative similarities, another feather in the cap for getting an extension done sooner than later. Like 
from a team standpoint, when you're proactive about some of these extensions, the Bears, for example, can go out and they don't have to franchise tag Montez Sweat because they got that extension done early, even though there was a little bit more uncertainty there of how he would look, uh, you know, going forward. Like they, they, they saw enough and they, they did that. And like they could go and they could franchise tag Jalen Johnson if they wanted to because they didn't have to save the franchise tag for Montez Sweat or they could um, you know ex- tie up some other money and like doing stuff like the Keenan Allen trade and because they had that already locked up but like the Jaguars weren't able to bring back Calvin Ridley because they didn't know exactly what they were going to do with Josh Allen like I think I think you 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 actually inject more uncertainty into your team building process when you're a year later on these extensions than a year earlier and I think we've seen teams move off of bad contracts a little bit easier than we see teams try to recoup value of not being able to play pay good players. Well, and now Rashawn Gary makes 24 million APY and Josh Allen makes 30. Yeah. All for, and like, and Rashawn Gary just signed his deal like a few months ago, you know? So, and again, hind, the benefit of hindsight is 2020. I get that, but the, uh, it, it's, it's just another idea. And again, if you don't want to sign Josh Allen, that's perfectly fine. It's 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 more the it's because you have Trayvon Walker, you have other players to care about, all this stuff. It's more the uncertainty part of it is just a to me a lack of not conviction because I we're analytics people like conviction maybe isn't the right word, but it's more of a misevaluation of your own player. I think this mm-hmm. is the price to pay when you misevaluate your own player, which you should be the best player, the best the best group to evaluate your own players like that that to me i think is a is a rough one yeah no i i totally agree um let's move on here to kabir devang who said what's your view on this year's safeties in the draft which safeties do you think will be targeted the most and at which picks well the the current marketage in this uh well so we we we're kind of we're gonna have a a mock draft uh out at sumer next week um the current market says no first round picks for for safeties this year, uh, which would be, which would you know that's kind of becoming more the norm. Um, I think depending upon the big board you like, I think Tyler Newbin from Minnesota is considered a pretty high, uh, highly regarded player, the redshirt senior, um, a little under twenty three years old. Uh, you know Javon Bullard from from Georgia. Um, you know the you have a little bit of a question on uh, Cooper DeJean, DeJean uh, from Iowa, whether mm-hmm. he's a safety, but like Cooper DeJean basically just played outside corner at Iowa. So it'd be a complete projection. I, I it's interesting. I, I think that the position has become so, uh, well, the position has become so efficient in the NFL as far as what people are paying in the free agency market and how, teams are valuing it. Justin Simmons is still available in free agency, even though he's probably a pretty good safety that the draft that you, you're probably going to see, you're not going to see a safety go very high. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think, I think this definitely is probably a a little bit of a lower year for safeties, but looking over some of the the stats bomb data, um, you know, that was sent. Like I think Cole Bishop from, from Utah is someone who uh, projects pretty well at the next level just because of some of his, his advanced data. He was only targeted on, on 8% of um, the, the passing plays uh, on defense, which is the lowest among the eight safeties that we have in this class. And he had the lowest EPA when targeted. So he was doing a good job of, of breaking up passes there. He's also someone that had a, a 20% blitz rate, which is the second highest among those eight safeties. So I think someone who's, who's pretty versatile. I know that Utah has a, has a couple good defensive players, um, you know, that they've produced lately and, and even in this year's draft. And I think he could be one of those guys where, you know, he ends up going later in the draft, but ends up being a pretty, pretty versatile uh, piece for whichever defensive coordinator ends up getting to, to use him. Well, and this is what makes the position hard because, you know, we've all done work on like weak link systems. Our friend Arjun Menon, who, by the way, big time, he's going to go on NFL yeah. Network tonight. I'm like, I hope he doesn't forget about us now that he's big yeah, time. Yeah, I know. When he's, yeah. So, um, but we've all talked about versatility and we've talked about weak links. And, and I had a, a friend in the NFL talk to me about weak, weak links. He's like, Eric, the weak links is about your strong links, right? It's, it's the Tyron Matthew who can make Daniel Sorensen look decent. Yeah. because he doesn't have to do that much it's uh you know it's um uh chris jones who makes michael dana 
not have you know have one assignment in the pass rush game and have to beat one player, never have to face a double team. And so your strong links are really what create the strengths in your weak links. The problem with this, though, is the guys like there aren't if you are a great defensive back in college, you're playing outside corner most of the time. Mm-hmm. And with and and I'll give you one example that's the exception that proves the rule, or a few examples. Minka Fitzpatrick, Brian Branch, the guys that have come into the league as these kind of like hybrids, where are they playing? They're playing in Alabama with other NFL players. Yeah. If you're a Legereus Sneed or like if you're playing and Legereus Sneed was a college safety, which you know. Uh, is a kind of an exception that proves the rule. But if you are the kind of uh, do everything kind of money backer, you know, star safety, you know, Jalen Ramsey of now, Charles Woodson of the past, Rod Woodson of the very past before you were born type of guy, you're not, but in college, you are the stud corner on your football team. So we, and this is where the scouting and the Thomas Dimitrovs and his teams of the world are so important. You're, we don't get data on those players. And, and, they're not we're dra- they're, they're the Cooper to jeans, right? And where we don't have data on them actually playing the position that maybe they might be best suited for in the NFL. And so this time of year, we're not even imagining those players in the spot that they may be more most valuable in. And so while I do believe that safety is a valuable position in that one particular role, now is not the time where they really manifest themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, no, that's a, that's also a good point. Like, I think, um, you know, you look at someone like Kyle Hamilton, where the the talent was clearly there. Um, you know, I think about it, we talked about this in the class play a couple of weeks ago. Like, think about his his Monday night game uh, against Virginia Tech. We had two interceptions. You know, he's able to to come across the field. Like, and the like, teams didn't really know how to handle him. He ran a little bit of a slower combine or forty at the combine. Um, you know, it was more up in the air. The Ravens were going more best player available in their drafts. Like, they felt comfortable taking him where they took him. And like, I think it, it again, like it, that took a little bit of time. It, it took Mike McDonald's scheme for him to, to really show that he could be one of the best safeties in the league. So it's like, there's, there's going to be, um, you know, a lot of changes to these positions, whether it's Cooper to Jean going from, from corner to, to safety, um, you know, whether it's some of the, these other safeties that, you know, are going to go play um, some type of nickel corner role. Like I think there's, there's so much flip-flopping that can have between these positions where it's much harder to project them going forward and like the, the the error bands around their uh their their kind of projection in the league if you're projecting like war or something is is always going to be a little bit wider because of that ravens are illustrative though in that you have marlon humphrey who right. is inside outside flexibility you had marcus williams who they signed to a free agent the year they drafted hamilton you had geno stone out of iowa who is one of my biggest hits i thought he was the best safety in that draft uh, and now, you know, obviously seven interceptions last year, he could play that middle of the field role that Hamilton's really not good at, right. Yeah. Or wasn't projected to be good at. And then you had the other guys, Mollette, Steve, like all the other guys kind of were the weak links, but because you had so much optionality with Williams, Humphrey, and now Hamilton, and then the linebackers and Smith, you know, Smith obviously made, uh, queen a lot better of a player. You, you, you were able, and, and now Hamilton's, Hamilton's so good at what he does, but he's allowed to fit in that. He's never put in a bad position, right? And uh, yeah, he's, I mean, that watching the AFC Championship game and Andy Reid holding on for dear life because none of the horizontal stuff would ever work against Hamilton was a sight to see uh, on that one. That was that was a good time. So really good question there. Um, here's a good one. Curious of a couple of your metrics for QBs. What is usage rate and why do you rank time to throw and scramble weight with higher numbers being better? Seems like time to throw should be opposite. And there's probably a middle ground for scramble rate. Uh, this is a good question. And yeah, so yeah, let, go ahead, Tage. You were the one. If, if if everybody no one if no one knows this, Tage was the the architect behind the whole. Uh, Tage and Sean did the write ups, but Tage on the data side was the architect behind the 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 uh, Sumer Sports uh, draft guide. Um, yeah, like the, the good questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've gotten the, you know, people to say a lot of uh, nice things about the draft guide since we put it out. So I appreciate everyone saying that. This is the most common question I've gotten is like, why was time to throw ranked higher and not the other way around? And so we had a, a year's worth of data that we were working with here. We had the, the top eight quarterbacks um, that we were able to put in the draft guide. So I wasn't really able to test whether time to throw 
uh, correlated with, with NFL success, both positively or, or negatively, um, you know, because in, in past years, like I, I just had this year's worth of data. So I thought it would be more intuitive to rank them one through eight where higher is, is better just because like, that's what you kind of expect for most metrics. I think scramble rate was the, was the same thing. If I were to go back and do it again, I wouldn't have colored those boxes. I would have just kind of left them gray so that there was no color association with them. And you could just know where they stood, um, from a, from a higher to lower, like, descending standpoint but um yeah i think as we get more years of data we can really start to test whether time to throw time to pressure um you know all that stuff leads to, to nfl success and we'll have more uh, of a bigger sample size as it goes forward in the future yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna defend you though um here's time to throw now this is from a different website pff but you know they're they're all yeah, they're all isomorphic they're homeomorphic to each other at least homomorphic to each other um Last year, top 10, Justin Fields, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, Russell Wilson, Joshua Dobbs, Patrick Mahomes, CJ Stroud, Zach Wilson, Bryce Young, Josh Allen. There's very good quarterbacks in there. There are some okay quarterbacks in there, and there's some pretty bad quarterbacks in there. Okay. So it's not necessarily good or bad to have high time to throw. Here are the lowest time to throw. Tua Tunga Bailoa, Trevor Lawrence, Derek Carr, Jared Goff, Matthew Stafford, Gardner Minshew, Desmond Ritter, Dak Prescott, Jordan Love, Brock Purdy, Geno Smith. There's some good quarterbacks in there. There's some okay quarterbacks in there. And then there's Derek Carr. The thing is, <laughs> it doesn't like it's just, it's just enough. It's a style. It's a what? It's not a how good. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay. And and I I'm I'm okay with you you having it put it now. Scramble rate is also a how good. It, it's sorry, it's a what, not a how good. Yeah. It's it's a styles make bites. And, and, and a thing here, by the way, mass, uh, love the draft guide. very easy to digest. I do think that the data visuals, um, are phenomenal. And, and, uh, Thomas Dimitrov, our boss, uh, has, has remarked that that's all he's wanted out of super sports is just a, a good, easy way to look at data. And I think, uh, he's, he's a great success story for us. He's, he's very fluent in, in that stuff now, which is awesome. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, have another question here from Sean, who is one of our, our very loyal and awesome listeners. As in-game athleticism scores become more publicly available, do you think that those will hold more weight in traditional than traditional testing numbers? Do you think that traditional testing will always have a place in evaluation pre-draft? Yeah, this is a, a great question from Sean. I know our, our friend Corey Yates is doing some really cool stuff with in-game athleticism scores at, at Real Analytics. Um, you know, I think there's there's other people that are also doing something similar. And I think it's gonna vary by position where I still think like a position like tight end, like we were talking about earlier, like the combine is is actually pretty important for tight end. You want them to to run a, a fast 40 yard dash. And um, you know, there's different metrics like like broad jump for quarterback that there's a cutoff around 110 inches on uh, you know, players that are that are able to consistently have positive EPA seasons. Like I still think that there, there's gonna be value in some of the cutoffs and uh, overall athleticism that that matters for certain positions, but in-game athleticism is is only going to improve as a predictor in a lot of models over time. Going back to what we were just talking about, like as we get a bigger sample size, as we're able to to tweak what exactly in-game athleticism actually is and which parts are, are predictive of future NFL performance and, and which aren't. Like, I think that a lot of it is, is going to be able to, to be parts in our models from a component standpoint where we can include different things like when a guard pulls and how fast they're running in the first five yards of, of that pull is like something that could translate to the next level, for example. Yeah. Mass says, is there anything more useless than a lineman's 40 time? Actually? Yeah. I mean, lineman actually, it, it's a, so I'm going to back up in, in in defense of the combine. The combine is a place where everybody is being tested under standardized conditions with the same expectations. That is still valuable information. It is always going it is going to decrease in value over time 100%, but as as our boss Thomas has always said there is value in looking at one player do it, do one thing and watch another player almost immediately have to do the exact same thing because football is so contextual that you're almost never like you watch a football game and you and I love football. That's the thing that I love about you so much is like you and I can go to a Lions game and just watch football and enjoy it. And we don't even we, we talk about the numbers, but but like the we just love the game. But you can watch the game and not see 
uh, Amon Ross St. Brown run 40 yards straight in the whole game. Yeah. And so if, if that's the case, and let's say he does that for two straight games and then has a hamstring, and then the whole season he's hampered by a hamstring. And let's say you want to build a player evaluation metric that's part production, part athleticism, part health. All three of those things are correlated to each other because they all happen at the same time. And and how do you un, how do you tease those things out in a low sample size event like football? It's not like, and it's not beyond the wit of man to figure that out or woman, but it is hard and it's not easy to interpret that and it's not easy to. So it's still important to have very easy, digestible, interpretable things to give to people. As long as people are going to continue to skip the combine, though, it is going to be important for us to have other measures. And that is, and I think that that's important. So Mass, like, I think that a 40 time for an offensive lineman measures a couple things. A, can he get out of a stance in an explosive way? That's Mm -hmm. a thing. B, can he prepare for an event that he knows he's going to have to be prepared for for months in advance? That's important, too, because that's part of being a professional athlete. And then, of course, is he athletic? Can he run fast? Is he athletic? Is he in good shape? Like those are those are things. And then the 40 yard dash is correlated with all kinds of stuff. It's correlated with broad jump. It's correlated with uh, vertical jump. It's correlated with the 10 yard dash, 20 yard. Dash. I, there are other. So it's not useless. Right. And and really nothing in football is useless. And that's the part that maybe us in analytics, we get a little, this is where we we aired at first. Nothing doesn't matter. It's just a lot of things matter very little, but you add them up, of course, and that's the eval. And and I think maybe the heart, the thing that we should have said, Tej, along the way is X doesn't matter that much, but also nothing really matters. Nothing matters absolutely. And that, Mm -hmm. and so I would say 40 yard dash doesn't matter absolutely to any position. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great point. I also think it, it can measure like an offense lineman's health as well. And just, yeah, like you said, like how well they're they're prepared for that. And I think about like standardized tests, for example, like the ones you take in high school, like, you know, I wasn't necessarily a, a big fan of, of making kids do the, all of those because like there's so many biases that can come into play um, with, with resources. But like, I get why we had to go through that in high school because I think about, I went to, you know, I grew up in a city where there were three high schools in that city. And when I would talk to some of my friends at other high schools, we were all taking the same U.S. history class. But one of my friends at another high school had a really easy teacher where they would watch documentaries and, and fill it out. Or there's another high school where they would make you do like 10 pages of written assignments all the time. Like your GPA in that class can vary a lot depending on the high school. So it's like maybe you do have this standardized test in place to see if someone got a 4.0 versus a 3.0 in U.S. history. What does that actually mean in the grand scheme of things? And like, you can use both of those things together when, um, you know, when, when choosing whether, which students you want to, to be admitted to your college. And like you said, like it means less over time. Once you're at college, like that doesn't mean as much as it, it was when you're applying to it. So I think that that's very similar to the combine where it's very standard. Um, you know, when you're measuring in-game athleticism, uh, there's, there's different fields that will be faster. There's, if you're using computer vision, there's different things that could happen to the camera that could make players look faster or slower. So like having all of these things in, in an aggregate is always really helpful. I even think that I've heard from a couple people at teams, like the, um, some of the interview scores, especially like when you, when you break it down into different components and you, you think about a, a player's confidence and different stuff like that. Like, I think that is something that can be useful in, in these, these models together. So it's like that, that's something that we probably don't have as much access to as, as public facing people. But like, I think teams are also factoring in all of that stuff in the aggregate when making their, uh, their, their draft models. Well, and th- th- they've done studies like in Ivy League schools that stopped taking standardized tests or requiring standardized tests. Um, there were they admitted fewer students from poor communities, yeah. from underrepresented groups, and because, like you said, those the schools that those kids came from, they didn't have enough identifiers that would help those students stand out. Hey, you got a four from this zip code. But that doesn't map to success. But you add on top of that a 36 SAT ACC score. Okay, now we'll take you into like, and right. it's the same thing. Like, if we took away the combine and all you had to work off of was somebody's tape 
from Lenore Ryan University, a Division II school, you may not have enough information to, to stamp a, a Kyle Duggar, right? But then he goes to the combine and tests well. Now you have tape, which is not definitive. You have the combine, which is not definitive. But now you add those two together, and maybe that's definitive. And and again, none of them in the in and of themselves, but the integral of them is is, is of course enough. Uh, let's do. Let's do okay. So we got three more questions. Um, I want your I want your answer to this one. I'm going to jump to the last one first, and then we'll come back to the pre, the previous two. What are your thoughts on Levis? I did an interview yesterday with uh, Pete Prisco, and uh, yeah, um, and, and uh, uh, Nick Costos, and I said I and you and I have been on this train since since before the the off season uh, that I like the Tennessee Titans. I think Brian Callahan's awesome. Uh, I agree that Tennessee has improved quite a bit in a few spots. Uh, this is from Zachy NFL, Caleb a Acab. Um, but a ton of it comes down to le what Levis can do for this team. And I agree. I mean, Levis is the guy, right? I mean, Levis determines whether this team is good long-term. What do you think, Tej? Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at your track record, uh, two years ago being on the Restore the Roar, Lions train last year being on the Packers train and both both teams, you know, exceeding expectations, uh, probably further than than most of their optimistic fans even thought. Like, I think the, the Titans might be the next version of that this year. And and we have been in, in lockstep with this. Like Ryan Callahan, I think, is, is really going to help their offense. Like obviously has the the reverse nepotism hire where he gets to bring his dad along <laughs> and, uh, and and really build up the offensive line. I think the assumption is that they're going to take a tackle there. And I think that that makes the Titans a wide tail team. Like you go out and get Calvin Midley, you go out and get Legereus Sneed. I think you're, you're really increasing your range of outcomes. I think when you look at Levis last year, um, you know, he was someone who had a 9.9% sack rate, which was 25th in the league. So like someone who, who was taking a lot of sacks last year, but was doing so because he wanted to push the ball downfield. And I think that as the Titans lean into that high variance uh, game plan, where you think about that Dolphins Monday night game, where Levis throws a, a pick six very early, but yep. then he's also leading those final two drives where the Titans, Titans score, go for two down eight, convert, score again, and end up winning that game and pulling off the big upset. Like I think there's going to be a lot of games like that this year uh, from the Titans where it could go like the commander season did last year, where it's like a Sam Howell season where there's, there's a lot of pick sixes and you end up with the number two pick uh, or, or top five pick, or, you know, you're kind of pushing towards like that, that more Packers uh, type season where your young quarterback really just takes multiple strides and you end up around nine wins and, and you're competing for the playoffs later in the year, just because of that high variance game style. Yeah. The only, I mean, it's really hard when, Levis, 25.3% pressure to sack ratio at Kentucky yeah. um, and as well as Penn State. Now, I said this on the on the Sirius XM show, which is going to air tonight at 7 p.m. on Channel 88 with Thomas. We we record on a little bit of a, a inside baseball. Thomas and I record on Friday morning, so we've already talked about it. Pressure to sack ratio is very stable. And last year, Levis was just over 21%. So he actually improved, even though 21% is still bad. So... It's a trait that that does map with you. Now, what I'd said to Thomas about Jaden Daniels is what I'm going to say about Levis. I don't think that pressure to sack ratio is an eliminator for a quarterback. I think you just have to have your eyes wide open when you draft a guy like that. And what I mean is you can't be the Bears and draft Justin Fields and then be like, good luck, buddy. And to give them no offensive line for three mm -hmm. years, and, or and now their offensive line's better. But you know what I'm saying? Like they brought him in, and like Cody, the the husk of Cody Whitehair is still there, and like, yeah. uh, you know, and, and they just don't, they didn't support him. Now, to me, this is where I'm I'm gonna again Levis, and these are the kind of quarterbacks I fail on. Levis has the arm, the athleticism. He's got the like kind of like I mean this. Uh, not pejoratively, I mean this positively. He's kind of stupid. Like he he will throw into places that like a more thoughtful quarterback won't throw into, which I think if you have DeAndre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley, that's a positive. And so I like Brian Callahan, his dad, Bill, and then of course, and then Captain, uh, Captain Acab, who asked this question, thank you. Take alt at seven. 
take a wide receiver 38 to be mm-hmm. the number three, get that ball out quickly. I think it can have some success. And remember, Brian Tannehill was a terrible pressure to sack ratio quarterback and a terrible sack ratio quarterback to begin with. But the Titans had success with him because they were able to work around it. So it's not impossible. And so that's that's kind of where I see it. I don't think he's a perfect player. And the the, the point about rookie contract quarterbacks is you don't have to be. Uh, and so that's that's my point about the Titans. The other part about this division is still got question marks with the Colts at quarterback with Richardson. I think we're all arrows up on him, but got to see it. Col- uh, Houston is kind of the classic where the Jags were last year. The Jags are kind of like what could go wrong with Houston this year. They're on the the tail end of that. And so it is opened up for them. I think Rand Carthon is a, you know, pretty good brain. Um, and like I said, I think Brian Callahan is good. So I think arrows up for, for, for our Titans here uh, this year. Um, okay. I want to ask Tage this question. If you were the bears and this comes from HD Katona, if you were the bears, how much would you need the commanders to give you to move up to one? Yeah. I mean, th- this is an awesome question. I think like, I'm I'm usually very pro trading back in the draft. Uh, quarterback is the one thing that I am I am okay with you not playing with your food on, right? Like not taking this trade back opportunity. You know, even trading up picks to to give yourself the opportunity to find a franchise quarterback. Like it's that important, especially to get one on a rookie contract. But you know, from, just just in a vacuum, like not thinking about what Ryan, the questions Ryan Pauls would have to answer if he he made that trade. Um, you know, I think like getting a a, the commander's second round pick this year, they get a fifth, let's say this year also. And then if they're able to get a, a future first in the next year, and then also a, another, another future pick, if they want that, like, I think those, those first three would be fine. Like that would be probably enough for me to, to move back from one to two. Um, you know, I would, based on just like the loser's curse research and, and different stuff, like 44% chance that Drake May is better than Caleb Williams, just looking at the historical trends, like not factoring into um, the, their actual prospect level. So it's like, do you want to make that bet where you can pick up that that future first and the second in this year's draft plus like a, a, a day two pick or, or sorry, a day three pick on top of that? Like, I think I think that would probably be enough for me, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think there. Okay, here's where I, th- so in a different division, I, agree with your first statement. Don't play with your food. Just take Caleb Williams. You've done a, a good job. I think Poles has done a great job. Now, he's not perfect. The, Clay, the Chase Claypool trade was something, you know, to behold. Um, they they haven't done everything perfectly. But they have Montez Sweat, premium position player. They have Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, uh, Darnell Wright, um, they have the ninth pick in this draft, their own pick. They have the first overall pick. The defense has, you know, Jalen Johnson, Jaquan Brisker, Kyler Gordon. They have two linebackers that are respectable. In in a lot of ways, you if you're Ryan Poles, I can't blame you at all for saying, I've built a pretty good roster. Caleb Williams has a pretty damn good chance of succeeding here no matter what. So that's 50% of me. The other 50% of me looks at Detroit and says that Brad Holmes has done a pretty damn good job. And I don't think that Brad Holmes is going to relent anytime soon. In fact, you can make a case that Brad Holmes has done this despite having Jared Goff. And I don't necessarily know if there's any indication that Ben Johnson's going to be a head coach anytime soon. He might just want to be the offensive coordinator of this franchise forever, in which case you're going to climb, you have to climb that mountain if you're the Bears. The Packers have done it again. They found another quarterback and they have a a lot of great young talent around him. And they have a defensive coordinator with a clue for the first time in like 20 years in Jeff Halfley. The Minnesota Vikings also have a clue. I think Quasey is a a good GM. Uh, If they get get Drake May out of this draft, they should start building the statue now. (laughs) So that other part of me says, you better start collecting the stones and mm-hmm. building. And so if if Washington gives you pick 40, pick 2, next year's one and like another day 2 pick, 
and you get Drake May out of it or or Jaden Daniels, whichever one you like more. Because this division is going to be the best division in football. Like, yeah, look around. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I, th- I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Like, I think it really comes down to like where you make that tier cutoff, right? Like I thought in last year's draft, and I guess, you know, CJ Stroud ended up becoming the best out of it. Like, I thought there was a, a, a top three in last year's draft. Like, picking that third quarterback, you don't have buyer's remorse. And you are, are playing just kind of like the odds of, of uncertainty about quarterbacks called to pro. The thing with this trade, if, if and obviously Ryan Poles isn't going to make this trade, but like if he did, there would be that buyer's remorse if Caleb Williams goes off to become better than, than Drake May. So it, it comes down to, um, you know, can Drake May plus the draft picks you're getting still get the value? But again, there's there's the the stuff that we can't measure of of the excitement of of Bears fans having a franchise quarterback. And you mentioned Brad Holmes. Like I think it's it's interesting to think about the Lions. And it was it was different kind of mine. It was, it was with veteran quarterbacks. But like if I draw kind of a, an analogy here, like Matthew Stafford, Caleb Williams, like you know high end arm talent, um, you know that that type of player. You think about Drake May. And Jared Goff, like they're seen as as a, a little bit below those those high end arm talent guys, but like still very capable of running an NFL offense. So both the Rams and the Lions made out very well in this trade. The Rams got their Super Bowl. The Rams got a quarterback that can execute the the offense that Sean McVay wants to. The Lions were able to build their roster to really support Jared Goff, where he's able to rank top ten in EPA per play two years in a row. So it's like is, is that is that kind of like the the bet that you want to make, um, where you you take maybe a couple steps down at quarterback, but the rest of your roster, you just feel a lot better about around that quarterback. And, and I think that I, right. And, and to me, if you think that there's, and there's always, a, that, that, and that's maybe where I come from as a math guy. And as a, as who's read Cade Massey's paper, right. I always think that there's doubt. And so to me, there's some doubt and so I'm going to want to continue to build this thing, right? Minnesota did the competitive rebuild thing. And funny, during the competitive part of it, Detroit and Green Bay won three playoff games and the Vikings won none. And now they have to trade a, a house to get the third or fourth best quarterback in this draft. They're not going to have, like, and, and again, they're, I think their head coach is great. I think their general manager is great. But like, you're competing with really heady people there. And a roster with a lot of premium position players and Derisaw and Jefferson and Hawkinson and, and Green uh, Grenard and guys like that. And Green Bay's got a great quarterback. And Detroit's got a great roster and a great team builder and a great head coach and a great offensive coordinator. Like, to me, I just don't know when you stop if you're in Chicago. Like, I think you just continue to pick up stuff. And if you continue to do that, Drake May may just be the guy that and, – and the other part is – and and. I think Washington is is moving in the right direction. But the other question that you have to ask with the buyer's remorse part is, do you have enough confidence in your own team building where buyer's remorse goes away a little bit because you have the confidence in your team building ability mm-hmm. versus other teams? Yeah. No, I mean, that, that, that's also what I, what I think it is, right? It's like, it, that, that's what it comes down to is is all of that stuff together, which which makes it a very complicated decision. Um, and then like the the tier drop off, like I'm sure the Bears will, will tell us they had Caleb Williams in a tier of his own. Um, you know that's very justifiable. Like I think it, it, you know looking at uh, a lot of what the what, what scouts are saying across uh, across media, like some people do have Caleb Williams in a tier of his own. If you have, let's say, all three of the top guys in the same tier, then that obviously makes you more inclined to trade down. Yeah. Um, we have two quick Lions questions to hit on <laughs> nice. before we finish uh, from my friend Iso here. How many more years does Goff have realistically to produce? I think the window on the lines might be shorter than most think because of quarterback. I think that's a fair point from Iso to bring up. Like I think Goff is obviously a little bit older at this point. I believe he's he's 30 or, or 31. But like I think it's not only the the Goff age thing. I, I still think he'll be fine just because his game shouldn't age poorly. It's not like someone like Russell Wilson who had to rely a lot on his agility to av- avoid sacks that he lost that throughout age. Like I think. Goff is is uh you know pretty much a, a very stationary quarterback. So like as long as he has the arm and the processing ability, he should be fine. I think more of the Lions window will come down to which guys do they end up paying? Like you're gonna have to pay St. Brown, you're gonna have to pay Penny Sewell, both top of the market extensions. 
do you maybe tell like someone like Ali McNeil, like we're, we're not going to be able to, to pay you. Like we'd, we'd look to trade you or do you even look to trade someone like Taylor Decker who's, who's older and, and getting towards the end of his contract as well and, and move Penny Sewell over. Like, I think that'll be uh, something interesting to watch that that might make the Lions window a little bit shorter than people think just because they, they don't have maybe an elite quarterback that can, that can give them that high yeah. floor. But Eric, there's a, there's another question for you here um, from Jeremy Friedrichs, who says, Eric, which wide receivers are your favorite fits for the Lions in this year's draft? Oh my gosh. Uh, that's a good question. I, and, and this is, you know, kind of independent of where they pick because obviously there are trades and stuff. Um, I, so I'm going to go back like 30 and beyond. Um, it's like, I, I like Adonai Mitchell. I think they need a taller guy. Um, you know, he has some speed, obviously. That's one that I like a lot. Uh, Troy Franklin's another one that I like at six foot three. Um, you know, in that Oregon offense, very explosive. Um, but, but actually one that's interesting that I know is kind of on the shit list for a lot of people. Um, and this gets back to the in-game athleticism score, our friend, uh, Corey Yates at Real Analytics. They could really use a Keon Coleman type, right? Like they don't other, you know, they, Amon Ross St. Brown's a separator. Uh, Jamison Williams is the deep threat separator, you know, Jalen Hyatt, Marquez Valdez, Scantling, Will Fuller type when he's there, when he's there, obviously you have the tight end in Laporta Coleman is that third and eight, get a first down box out somebody kind of player that that's the type they need. Right. And, and I think that one of the things that we revealed through our research is after you get past those like first few guys, it's all about fitting. It's like we were uh, Thomas and I were at the Hawks facility a couple of days ago and it's, it's all it, in basketball. It's not about positions anymore. It's about traits. Right. And I think wide receiver, it's not about X, Y, Z anymore, or sorry, would it be X, Z, H it's, it's about, you know, in slot, right. But it's about, it's about traits. It's about the downfield player, which in the chiefs offense, interesting Valdez Scantling playing the slot all the time, but ran the deep routes in other offenses. It'd be the X that did that. Um, it's the downfield guy, the underneath separator, and kind of the big guy, sort of power forward type that that has to get has to get those tough yards. In the a a NFC Championship game against the 49ers, I think a lot of people looked at Josh Reynolds. They looked at Josh Reynolds for that, and he was pretty good at that last year. Mm -hmm. Came up short in the biggest game of the season, but for the most part, played well at that spot. I think that they need to replicate that now that he's gone. Right, I totally agree with you. Right, like I think. They had that uh, uh, before last year with DJ Chark. Where like I don't think DJ Chark's a, a good receiver, but he was uh, he was like an X type receiver. Um, where like you're you're not necessarily ch chasing those those archetypes because there's so many ways to build receiver rooms. But like I think that they 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 might be missing um, you know someone who can who can really win contested catches right now. Like I think so much of it relies on Ben Johnson, who you brought up earlier, like scheming open. Like Josh Reynolds was always someone who was like schemed open i thought on uh some of those those later downs and so i think um getting someone who doesn't necessarily have to be open but can still win contested catches like keon coleman could be an intriguing option i hope that the lions take a receiver in round two just because they need defensive help in round one and also there's that there's going to be a lot of receivers available in round two ricky pearsall is one that's that's come up a lot while i've been doing mock drafts um on, on simulators as as an option um, you know, if you want to go to, to round three, I think that it depends what you think of Jamison Williams. If you kind of want to um, have a, a, a opinion on, you know, after one and a half seasons of, of him playing through injuries and, and suspensions, kind of like if if you think that maybe the ship has sailed on him, you, you take a chance on someone like Jermaine Burden, who has some character concerns that the athletic football show was talking about the other day, but like could be that that deep threat that fills in for you. Um, like, I think, I think those are kind of like the options that the Lions will be looking for at receiver. And I'd, I'd be pretty happy if they ended up with, with a guy like that. So one last question, and this is from me to you as a Lions fan, because I'm also a Lions fan because of you. Um, if they are looking for the quarterback of the future, how early is too early here? Cause I know that they took a guy last year and you know, not a ton of experience. Like Bridgewater was their backup last year. He didn't play much. And so there's no experience there. And 
but this quarterback has some potential. Like this quarterback class has, like there's Rattler, there's guys like that that could eventually play and be decent players. We're not in an era where those guys exist much, but Prescott, Cousins, guys like that have happened. In a perfect world, if the Lions take a quarterback day two and beyond, and he could eventually supplant Goff, who is that quarterback? Yeah, I mean, that, that is another good question. Um, you know, the, the Hendon Hooker pick, I think, was was a, a debatable pick at the time. Not, I mean, it is good to take a quarterback, uh, someone talented like him, I think, you know, pressure to sack ratio um, and his his age was with the, with the red flags. But like, it's, it's a fine bet to make. So I think that might limit them a little bit on quarterback this year. But between like the three in the next tier that might be available in round two, like I would take a shot on, on Spencer Rattler because I think he's someone that was affected a lot by his offensive line last year. And the offensive scheme wasn't conducive for him. He didn't have uh, a second receiving threat behind Xavier Leggett. And so like he's someone where the arm talent can really hit uh, and, and take your offense to the next level. In the majority of, of scenarios, Spencer Rattler doesn't work out as an NFL quarterback. But if you condition it on all of these quarterbacks, being starting level quarterbacks, he probably has the highest ability to, to make the most of it, to become a top 10, top eight quarterback. Um, and, and he's someone that if the Lions do take him, like would be provided a, a really good offensive line and a, and a scheme that would fit his traits if he ends up getting in the game and playing. I like that one. He's kind of Stefan Diggs like in that he had really good high school recruiting, you know, yeah. college recruiting, uh, fa faltered a little bit, but I don't know how much you can blame a guy for getting beat out by who's going to be the first overall pick in this draft. Right. Um, rebounded, was performed pretty well, is going to be a later round pick. I like that a lot. Here are two names for me. If I'm looking in the late rounds for a backup quarterback, a guy who I want to be my backup, Jordan Travis of, of Florida State. I like his movement skills. I like his, I like his – I just like him. I, I've always watched him. I always watched him play, and back when I could bet, if I was betting against Florida State, it always scared the living hell out of me whenever Jordan Travis had the ball. That's the kind of backup quarterback you want. And if I'm looking for a starter, and this is to my, you know, hilltoppers, I've always liked Western Kentucky's offense, and I've always thought it was aesthetically pleasing. I like Austin Reed as a long, 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 long shot to be a starter in the NFL. Uh, it's not going to happen, but if I was, I always take him in the, in the mock draft sim. So this has been a lot of fun, Tej. Thank you so much for making, uh, you know, no, towards the end of the end of the draft cycle, the weeks are long. So thank you for making my week, uh, more fun. Um, we'll be back tomorrow with the podcast with me and Ben. We're going to preview the UFL schedule. We're going to talk about the draft and where the markets are, but thank you all for your questions. This has been a lot of fun for Tej Seth, for Eric Eager, for producer Matt Stopsky. This has been the Sumer Sports Show.